Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, two of my most recent works. These are in collaboration with uh, Ivan Kukulian, who is a PhD student in Ljubljana, and Gabor Takas, who is a, a professor of theoretical physics in Budapest. Uh, one of the works has already been published in PRL uh, last year. Uh, the other one is uh, more recent. I have put the archive number uh, for any, everyone who is interested to have a look. So I'm going to talk about uh, uh, correlation functions of the quantum sign Gordon model. Uh, uh, as Marek uh, already introduced to uh, the idea, correlation functions give us a complete characterization of uh, a quantum state. So uh, it's uh, useful to uh, have ways to calculate them and compute them. Uh, and uh, today I'm going to present uh, a combination of numerical methods and analytical techniques for the calculation of uh, correlation functions. Uh, and I'm going to start by giving uh, motivation for, for our work. So, uh, first of all, we are interested in quantum, quantum many-body physics because, and especially more recently in quantum many-body physics out of equilibrium, uh, especially because uh, this, uh, this, this research is going to uh, allow us to answer some fundamental and long-standing questions uh, in the field of statistical mechanics. Uh, for example, questions related to ergodicity of quantum systems, and uh, it will allow us to understand how thermalization uh, emerges in uh, quantum systems. Uh, or more generally, how equilibration uh, emerges if the system is integrable and has uh, uh, conserved quantities, more conserved quantities than just the energy. Uh, it will allow us to investigate uh, quantum transport in uh, uh, quantum materials and in this way uh, take advantage of the of macroscopic manifestation of quantum physics in for applications to quantum technologies. And uh, if one asks why are we more uh, interested in these questions today than in the past, then uh, one of the answers is that there is great experimental progress uh, in the research decades, uh, which allows us to simulate uh, quantum systems and uh, uh, observe their uh, dynamics uh, in the lab. But also there, are, there is great progress in numerical techniques which allows us to simulate uh, models uh, on, on the computer and uh, have predictions, theoretical predictions that we can later compare with uh, the experimental uh, data. Uh, and I should also say that despite the fact that uh, this field is uh, uh, more uh, this type of research is more popular in the fields of, in the areas of condensed matter and high energy physics uh, and atomic physics as well. There are applications to uh, uh, all uh, essentially areas of uh, theoretical physics, including cosmology uh, and uh, string theory, etc. So let me start by giving the experimental motivation for our work. Uh, which is actually based on experiments that were, uh, were done here in Vienna in the group of uh, Professor Schmidmeier. Uh, so a couple of years ago, they managed to, to do a quantum simulation of the sine gordon model. Uh, these type of experiments are uh, based on the atom chip, atom chip technology. So uh, the, the, the experimentalists can uh, form one-dimensional traps where they load uh, atoms and they, uh, they let them form one-dimensional quasi-condensates. And the new thing is that they can split the condensate in two parallel uh, long, uh, uh, long traps so that they can uh, uh, simulate the sine gordon model. The theoretical description is going to come in the next slide. Uh, I should only say here that uh, the coupling between the weak coupling between the two condensates plays the role of a Josephson junction, which, if we see the, uh, if we describe the system in terms of the density and phase fields, uh, gives us as a low energy description of the system the sine Gordon model. Uh, now, by uh, 
probing, by, by observing the interference patterns of uh, uh, atoms expanding after, uh, such, after we perform such a splitting of the condensate, we can uh, measure, we can, uh, we can indirectly uh, infer information about multipoint correlation functions of the uh, system at the time that we perform the expansion of the gas. So in this way, we can have space and time resolved measurements of the phase of the system. And uh, this is what uh, um, the experimenters have done. Uh, now, the theoretical description is based on the so-called uh, bosonization method. So as I said, if we introduce, if we express uh, the atomic uh, gas in terms of uh, the phase and density uh, fields, then the system is described by the uh, sine Gordon Hamiltonian. More specifically, the anti-symmetric part of the two-component gas uh, is described by the sine Gordon Hamiltonian, while the symmetric part is described by Latin the liquid theory. Uh, now, as you can see, uh, the sine Gordon Hamiltonian is nothing but uh, uh, the perturbation of the Latin the liquid Hamiltonian, the first part in the round brackets by an interaction term that the, corresponds to the cosine, that has a cosine form. Uh, of course, in, uh, in, in the two opposite limits, we can uh, make the cosine potential very uh, deep, which uh, means that the system is well described by a parabolic potential, uh, which is simply the so-called Klein-Gordon model while in the opposite limit we can make the uh, cosine potential, well, we can reduce the, the, uh, the amplitude of the interaction, and then we have, we go back to larger liquid uh, physics. Uh, so the experiment gives us a lot of uh, uh, flexibility and tunability of the parameters so that we can observe all the regimes of this uh, model. Uh, and now here I'm presenting some plots of the experimental paper where one can see uh, evidence of uh, sine Gordon physics, in particular the presence of solitonic excitations in the system. So in the upper plot you can see the full counting statistics uh, of the phase measurements and you can see that uh, uh, in certain states for certain parameters uh, the the probability distribution of the phases does not have the uh, standard bell-shaped uh, form, but uh, it exhibits some satellite peaks at the position, uh, at positions 2 pi. So this means that uh, by making the measurement, I can measure values for the field not only, at, uh, not, not only close to zero, but also at 2 pi and minus 2 pi which is an indication that uh, there are solitons present in, in these uh, configurations. Marek previously already explained how this uh, analysis of the uh, interference patterns is made in order to extract the phase profiles. Uh, <coughs> you can see in the second, uh, in the bottom part of the plot, uh, an example of such uh, phase profiles. Uh, where the value of the phase field interpolates from 2 pi to 0. So there is a difference of 2 pi between the two edges of the system, which, uh, which is nothing but uh, exactly a king configuration, which is the characteristic uh, salt excitation of the sine Gordon model. Uh, beyond that, the experimentalist can measure, as I said, higher order correlation functions, which gives us access to measurements of the non gaussianity of the, uh, of the state of the system. So by varying the parameters uh, of uh, the experimental parameters, one can see a crossover between the uh, highly massive Klein-Gordon uh, ground and thermal states, which are Gaussian states in terms of the phase and density field, uh, and for which, therefore, we expect Weak's theorem to be valid, which means that higher order connected correlation functions vanish. And this is what we see in uh, the plots <coughs> A and C, the upper and the lower plots. 
while for intermediate values of the parameters, we are strongly, we are in the strongly interacting regime. So four-point correlations, uh, uh, the connected part of four-point correlations is also uh, significant. So to, to, to give more details, uh, these are plots of the four-point connected, uh, of the four-point correlation functions, the full, the disconnected part and the connected part, which is the difference between the two. Uh, where we have fixed two points and the other two points are free. Uh, so this, is, this is how we get the density plots. Um, so experimentally, uh, we have identified, the experimentalists have identified three different regimes, the highly massive, the highly mass, the, the massless regime, and the strongly interacting regime that corresponds to intermediate values of uh, the parameter lambda over L. Uh, to quantify the deviations from Gaussianity, uh, the experimentalists have used uh, this uh, relative kurtosis uh, uh, quantity, which is the ratio of the connected part of uh, four-point correlations integrated over all the system uh, divided by the full four-point correlations, which shows explicitly that at the two limits uh, for uh, in, in the left, on the left edge and the rightmost edge of this plot, we get values of the kurtosis close to zero, while for intermediate values we get uh, values of the kurtosis that are that deviate significantly from from zero. Uh, however, one problem in in this type of experiments is that uh, there is no theory to to make a comparison, uh, a precise comparison with. So, uh, as I'm going to explain later. Uh, theoretical predictions for correlation functions are not possible by means of analytical methods so far. And so the experimentalists could only make comparison with classical predictions, classical field theoretical uh, description, uh, the description of the model, which turns out to be sufficiently good for uh, some parameter uh, regimes, but not always uh, sufficient. So there is a, a gap in the uh, in the literature and in, re in the uh, understanding of this model, which uh, refers to the quantum uh, properties of the model, uh, as far as correlation functions are concerned. Uh, another interesting uh, experiment performed in the same context uh, is the experimental observation of the generalized Gibbs ensemble. Uh, so by tuning the parameters from uh, the highly massive to the massless regime, the experimentalist could see uh, the dynamics of, um, of a state that is initially short range correlated uh, under the Lattinger liquid dynamics uh, and uh, deviations, small deviations in the uh, free uh, always approximation. And in this way, they could see they could probe the system at different time instances and they could see the time evolution of the correlation functions. And this way, uh, they could, uh, for the first time, observe the so-called generalized Gibbs ensemble, which is a thermodynamic a statistical ensemble describing systems that possess a large number of conserved quantities. In particular here, the dynamics is described by uh, the free Lattinger liquid uh, model together with uh, uh, quadratic corrections of the dispersion. And therefore, being free, it's definitely an integrable model. And so uh, it, the steady state after such a, a quench, as it is called, is described by the generalized uh, Gibbs ensemble. In this case, it is possible to make theoretical predictions exactly because the uh, dynamics is under a free theory. OK, so let me go now to uh, the main part of my talk. Uh, let me first introduce the model that we are interested in. Uh, the sine gordon model is a relativistic quantum field theory in one dimension. Uh, it is described by the Hamiltonian shown here. So apart from the quadratic part that corresponds to free massless, uh, to the free massless theory, there is the cosine uh, interaction. And already at the classical level, uh, it has, uh, it possesses uh, topological excitations like solitons. Uh, and 
It has been, uh, it is already known since uh, the beginning of uh, the previous century, essentially that uh, solitons interact, uh, scatter with each other without uh, changing their form, so they are, their shape is preserved. And they can also form bound states, which are called breeders. And all of these properties uh, remain uh, also in the quantum model. They are also present in the quantum model. And by exploiting this fact and also the other properties of um, uh, other, uh, and also the relativistic properties of the model, it is possible to solve it exactly by means of the, the so-called integrable um, quantum field theory or the, the, the so-called S-matrix bootstrap. Uh, it also has very interesting, a very interesting phase uh, diagram uh, exhibiting a costally starless phase transition. Uh, in this diagram, you can see that uh, uh, by changing the interaction, we can make this, we can uh, uh, go into the massless uh, region, uh, the massless phase, which is the blue triangle at the corner. And uh, while the red and the green areas are massive phases, uh, with the difference being that in the green area, solitons are repulsing each other, while in the red area they are attracting each other. And the dust line uh, uh, shows the position of the so-called Thiering line or the free fermion line. Uh, so solitons can be uh, considered, as I'm going to show also later, as uh, fermionic uh, excitations in the, in the context of uh, uh, the beta ansatz model. And at the, if we tune the interaction delta, which is a reparametrization of the beta parameter, uh, to a specific value, the system becomes free in terms of uh, its fermionic uh, equivalent description. Uh, this is also one of the first examples of uh, duality in quantum field theory. Uh, which was pioneered by Coleman and Manderstam in the 75s, who showed that by exploiting this boson fermion correspondence, a very uh, powerful uh, transform field transformation, nonlinear field transformation in one dimension, one can map the sine Gordon model to the massive uh, Thiering model, which is a model of interacting fermions. Okay, uh, other, uh, another very important property of the sine Gordon model is, as I said, that it's integrable, which makes it possible to solve it by means of the beta ansatz, uh, which means that uh, solitons are uh, scattered with each other in an elastic way, uh, and gives us a lot of uh, useful analytical properties. Uh, nevertheless, despite the integrability of the model, the correlation correlation function is still the calculation correlation function is still very hard to achieve. And if one follows the path of the uh, of progress in uh, the context of uh, integrable quantum field theory, then we can see that small steps are done every couple of years. But nevertheless, we are still far from the goal, which is the uh, theoretical calculation of. Uh, general correlation functions, especially in the context of uh, dynamics, out of equilibrium states, and also thermal states, which are the most problematic uh, cases. So this means that perhaps one should try an alternative approach, and uh, instead of following the analytical, uh, the, the path of analytical calculation, one should try some numerical technique, which is what we, we did, and somehow cheated in a sense. Uh, so I'm going to spend now a couple of slides to explain the method that we used in order to, to do this uh, computation. Our method is based on the so-called truncated conformal space approach, which is a numerical technique for the uh, calculation of the spectra of uh, uh, strongly uh, interacting Hamiltonians in one plus one dimension. Uh, it's applicable to uh, continuous quantum field theories so this is in contrast to standard uh, density matrix normalization group theory and uh, MPS techniques. Uh, our method uh, is useful for continuous models instead of lattice uh, systems. Uh, it is based on the early uh, formulation of normalization group theory 
and on algebraic tools uh, from conformal field theory. And uh, it has been used for, it has been introduced in 91, and then later used for the San Gordon model by uh, Takax, Favarati, and Ravanini. And our implementation was the first to, to, uh, to allow the calculation of correlation functions and dynamics in this uh, context. I should also say that it can capture efficiently non-perturbative effects. I'm going to give some more details uh, on how it works. Uh, so the main problem uh, at hand is to find the spectrum of uh, the Hamiltonian of a continuous quantum field theory in one dimension. Uh, so, uh, considering the problem in finite volume, uh, the first assumption that we make is that the Hamiltonian can be split in two parts, where the first is an exactly solvable uh, Hamiltonian with uh, a known spectrum and eigenstates, and the other part is uh, a perturbation, let's call it, even though the method is not perturbative. Uh, which has known matrix elements in the eigenstate basis of H0. So now by, by putting the system in finite volume, we know that the spectrum is discrete. And then by applying, in addition, a high energy cutoff, we truncate the Hilbert phase, which is, makes it, which makes it uh, possible to diagonalize the system because now it's a finite uh, dimensional, uh, uh, the Hamiltonian is a finite dimensional uh, matrix. So, uh, of course, by doing this, uh, this step of diagonalizing the uh, truncated Hamiltonian and increasing the cutoff, nothing guarantees, in, in general, that we are going to reach uh, convergence to the exact spectrum of the actual Hamiltonian we want to, to study. But here comes the idea from the, the, the main idea from RG theory. If we choose H0 to be the conformal field theory that describes the uh, the high energy part of the spectrum of H and delta H to be a relevant operator, then RG theory tells us that uh, delta H, the perturbation, is going to affect the low energy part of the spectrum, but is not going to affect significantly the high energy part of the, the spectrum. So it doesn't mix the two uh, uh, sectors of the Hilbert phase of the unperturbed Hamiltonian. And in this way, if we uh, apply this truncation strategy and uh, keep increasing the truncation cutoff, we eventually are going to, to reach convergence because we are going to include more and more states that do not contribute at all to the, the, the low energy part of the spectrum. So this is the idea, and this is what uh, uh, makes the, uh, the method work. And the uh, implementation that we, we did in our recent work uh, was uh, to, to add in this context also the possibility to calculate observables in the same basis, uh, the truncated basis, so that we can calculate also the, uh, the expectation values of observables in states of uh, physical interest, like thermal states, or uh, their dynamics under uh, quantum quents. Uh, this is just to show that uh, the, the algebraic calculations can be uh, quite uh, nasty, but the, the main idea of the method is this. Okay, so uh, here are the results of our calculation. Uh, we focused on uh, two-point and four-point correlations of the sine gordon model, and for reference, we look also at the massless and the massive free case in order to, to have some benchmark and also comparison. Uh, so, uh, the system is of uh, size L. We consider boundary conditions of Dirichlet type. This is just a choice. And uh, in these density plots, you see the two-point correlation functions. You can notice that in the massive case, correlations are short range. They are very close to the diagonal, exponential decaying away from the diagonal. Uh, while in the massless case, they are long range. They are much more widespread. These are the five field correlations. So analytically, we know that uh, they are going to, to decay logarithmically in the infinite uh, system size system. Uh, and then in the sine Gordon model, we find that the correlations of the phase field are much more extended than in the uh, massive Klein Gordon case, despite the fact that the sine Gordon in this regime is uh, a gapped, uh, it's, it's in a gapped phase. 
These are always uh, ground state correlations. Moreover, we studied the effect of temperature, and you can see in these plots uh, that uh, by increasing the temperature in this, uh, by going from the upper row to the lower rows, uh, the correlation becomes become much more extended. And also, uh, despite the fact that we already know that the, all, also the ground state and all thermal states are non-Gaussian, we see that the uh, deviation from uh, non-Gaussianity is very small. Uh, the deviation from Gaussianity is very small for the ground state, but becomes progressively uh, larger and larger as we increase the temperature. We have an explanation for that later. So, uh, in particular, in the third uh, column, you see the four-point connected correlations. And while for the ground state, you can only see uh, some uh, very mild uh, blue tones. Uh, in the third row, you can see much stronger uh, deviation from Gaussianity. Uh, by the analysis of the uh, kurtosis, which, as I said, is the ratio of uh, connected four-point correlations integrated in the system over the full four-point correlations, we can uh, quantify these deviations from Gaussianity. And uh, what we get is precisely the, uh, we, we get precisely the classification that was already seen in the experiment. That is, for low temperatures, the system, despite the fact that the system is interacting uh, quantum field theory, uh, it's close to big Gaussian. The ground state is close to big Gaussian, and the low temperature thermal states are also uh, close to Gaussian because we are at the bottom of the cosine potential. So essentially, we see the parabolic uh, appro approximation of, uh, of the interaction. While by increasing the uh, temperature, we are going more and more to intermediate uh, heights. Uh, of the cosine potential, so we, we see stronger, we feel stronger the effect of interactions. Uh, and at higher, even higher temperature, we are much above the, the maximum of the uh, cosine potential, so we don't feel it uh, that much, and it's as if the, the interaction is not there at all, which is exactly the latent air liquid uh, regime of the, of the system. And therefore, we see precisely the three different regimes also observed in the experiment. Uh, by identifying the temperature with uh, the experimental parameter that is uh, used for tuning the, the effect of interactions. Uh, apart from that, we can do a lot of other numerical experiments, for example, we can study the excited states and then we see different patterns in the uh, uh, two-point and four-point correlations. So far, this is just for uh, uh, to get an idea of uh, what I can get, rather than a systematic analysis of uh, um, of the properties of uh, observables. But we can already see that uh, even by slightly changing the uh, the energy of the excited state of the system, uh, we can get completely different patterns in the in the four-point uh, and two-point correlations which is probably an evidence of uh, the violation of eigenstein thermalization hypothesis. So the sine gordon model is an integrable model. Therefore, uh, it, it, the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis is not valid for this model. And, and this is a manifestation of that. I should say probably a few words. Uh, so the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis tells us that for a non-integrable system in the thermodynamic limit, uh, observables are going to have smooth uh, 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 values when we change the, the, the energy of the excited state. So if we know the energy of an excited state, we can, uh, we can predict essentially the value of, uh, of an observable. And this is a, a hypothesis on the basis of which one can justify, can explain thermalization in non-integrable systems. While for non-integrable, for integrable systems, uh, one needs to generalize this idea and say that it's not only the energy that is uh, needed in order to, uh, to, to, to get an estimate of uh, local observables, but we need information about all the other conserved quantities. So uh, 
just by choosing, just by changing the energy, we don't get a smooth uh, uh, behavior for local observables, but uh, we can have rather abrupt changes. Uh, okay, so the next thing is uh, that we can do, uh, we can start design Gordon dynamics, which is also possible in the experiment, and it hasn't been done so far exactly because there was no possibility to measure, to, to, to compare with uh, uh, theoretical predictions. And so here I'm showing some example of uh, quench dynamics uh, that corresponds to starting from an excited state of the sine Gordon model and doing the dynamics with a different value, always with the sine Gordon uh, Hamiltonian, but with different value of the parameters. Uh, for example, here we quench the interaction, the value of the interaction delta. And you can see that we can get uh, uh, dynamics that is completely different from the, the ones that we get for uh, free theories, like free masses or massive uh, dynamics, with the same parameters, parameter values uh, for the mass gap, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, here is a, a, a movie that uh, we have made based on this data. Uh, you can see that, uh, uh, among other things, that the sine Gordon dynamics re results in a change in the pattern of the four-point connected correlations. Uh, unlike the massive free bosonic case, uh, which is the middle column, but also the first one, which re refers to the massless case, where correlations do not significantly change from their initial pattern, uh, in the sine Gordon case, they change completely from a, a, a checkerboard structure to a cross-like structure. These are just, again, numerical experiments which uh, could uh, help in more precise quantitative uh, comparison with uh, the experimental uh, data uh, someday. We are actually already working with uh, uh, Professor Schmidt-Meyer in some of these directions. Uh, this is another example of, a, of quench dynamics where one can see clearer how the correlations, the, the magnitude of uh, uh, non-Gaussianity changes when we start from uh, a ground state of the sine Gordon model and quench to another value of the interaction. And in this case, we were also able to do a spectral analysis of the of the observed correlations and identify the strongest contribution uh, uh, in, in the frequencies uh, of these time series, which comes from the uh, contribution of the second uh, breather, so uh, a bound state between a soliton and an anti-soliton, uh, of, of uh, coming from the exact beta yang equations for this system. Okay, so now I would like to, to pass to the second part uh, of uh, the talk, which is, again, an application of our numerical technique, but also uh, supported by analytical calculations, in which I focus more on a very specific aspect of the uh, dynamics of correlation functions and their interacting uh, dynamics described by the sine Gordon model. So in the context of uh, quantum quenches in quantum field theories, there is a well-known effect that is called horizon effect, uh, or sometimes light cone dynamics, which was uh, introduced, well, at least in, in, the, in, this, uh, uh, in the context of quantum quenches by Calabrese and Cardi in 2006. Uh, so let me uh, explain it in this way. Uh, let's consider the simplest example of a quantum field theory quench that we can think of, which is take a, the Klein-Gordon model and change the mass of the model uh, from M0 to another value. So we start with the ground state of the Klein-Gordon for some value of the mass, and then we change to another value. And we focus on the, on the dynamics of the two-point correlation as a function of space and time. Then if we plot this, we will see a very clear pattern of light cone spreading. Uh, so you can see that the, the correlations are 
the connected correlations are uh, significant only inside the light cone, while they decay very fast exponentially outside of it. Uh, where by light cone I mean the geometrical region uh, included in the lines distance is equal to two times the speed of uh, light or sound in experimental systems times the time. And I'm going to explain the reason for these uh, two. So one way to formulate this uh, horizon effect is by saying that uh, if uh, two observers are sitting at the points at distance r uh, and the quench takes place at time t is equal to zero, then uh, the first signal of, the, of this abrupt change of the quench is going to be uh, visible in their uh, mutual measurements uh, when time equals to uh, two times the distance, when, when time, is equal, time e equals to half of the distance between the two observers has passed, because considering the speed of light equal to one, because this is the time that is needed for a pair of entangled particles coming from nearby points at distance xi, where xi is the initial correlation length, is needed in order for them to reach the two observers. So this is the explanation that was uh, the intuitive explanation given by uh, Cardi and Calabrese in 2006. And if we want to express it in mathematical form, I would say that the connected part of uh, uh, the expectation values of uh, two local observables uh, is bounded by an exponentially decaying function, uh, function that decays exponentially with the distance minus two, two times the, the time. This is exactly the, the shape of the uh, horizon. Now, one can understand this on the basis of the relativistic, uh, uh, relativistic invariance of dynamics, and also, as I'm going to explain later, uh, on the fact that the initial state has short-range correlations, so that uh, it's only pairs of particles at nearby points within a distance of the order of the, the correlation length that are initially entangled and can therefore spread the entanglement through the system. Uh, since then, the, system, the, 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 the effect has been uh, seen in uh, a variety of uh, different systems, even systems with long-range interactions sometimes, uh, uh, for some, uh, within some parameter regime, of course. Uh, mostly in lattice systems where we can perform numerical simulations and for which uh, uh, when interactions are strict, are, are local, uh, the, the analog of uh, relativistic invariance is given in precise terms by means of the Lieb Robinson bounds. So that's just for uh, a quantum Yes, so we do one quench and we uh, observe the time evolution. So what would happen if you have a, a quench which is not instantaneous and then constant, but, uh, but with some time dependence? So in, uh, in this case, uh, during the, the, the ramp or the time evolution that leads to uh, the initial state, uh, some correlations will have spread through the system. So uh, I, I would say that uh, one expects the initial correlation length to be larger because particles have already traveled for a little bit. Or it could be also that uh, long-range correlations are present in the initial state. By initial, meaning the, the state at the end of this process. So, and I guess uh, I'm also wondering, by modulating, if I would keep modulating the, the Hamiltonian, like yeah. I switch on and then I keep doing something, can I, uh, do you think I can increase the speed of that propagation? Can I get a different bound than the Lee Robinson bound for constant quench? Uh, sure, the, the speed of the propagation, which corresponds uh, in physical terms to the maximum group velocity of excitation, is modulated uh, following precisely the dynamics of, uh, of the Hamiltonian with which uh, uh, we change the time dependence of the Hamiltonians that we use. Uh, I'm always thinking of situations where the change is rather uh, s smooth and slow in comparison with uh, the other time, time scales in the system. If we are talking about faster 
uh, Floquet dynamics, then uh, one would have to, to understand the properties of the Floquet uh, Hamiltonian. And in that case, the Floquet Hamiltonians are typically uh, not characterized by local but by long range uh, interactions. So it could be, it is most likely that the Libre Obis about would be broken completely. Uh, that's my first answer. I think this, uh, this must have been studied also in a number of uh, papers, and uh, this is what I can recall from what I have seen so far. Uh, so I would be very interested in getting references to that, because in, uh, in our language, that would be the quantum speed limit mm -hmm. for an excitation in a, in a many-body system. And uh, I'm not aware of literature on that, so if you are aware of that, that would be very, very interesting for me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are studies for Floquet dynamics in particular. Okay, so uh, apart from numerical simulations for such uh, mostly lattice systems, there have been also experiments observing this, um, this effect. Uh, these are some slides corresponding. The first one corresponds to a lattice model. The last one uh, to a model that has, if I remember correctly, also long-range interactions. And the middle one is one of the experiments of the Schmidt-Meyer group, uh, which is based, again, on this uh, continuous model of uh, the bosonized description of, uh, of, a, of an atomic gas. In this case, in the Latinger liquid regime. So it has, it's an effect that has been observed several times in the lab. So let's see now what we get if we uh, study the, the, the effect of interactions, and in particular topological excitations in, the, in operator in, in correlation spreading. So uh, we used our method, the truncated conformal space approach, to study the spreading of correlations in the sine gordon model. We are looking here uh, in the first row in phase correlations, five field uh, two-point correlations. And in the second row, we are looking at uh, uh, correlations of the derivative of phi field. The reason is that the phase field, as you know, in quantum mechanics, the phase uh, is measured only uh, as, as it, uh, one can measure phases only in reference to a specific point. It's only phase difference that can be measured and not uh, the phase itself. So due to the fact that the field is compactified, uh, uh, the phase field is uh, inevitably non-local because I have to measure it from some point, uh, the, the phase difference of the system at some point with respect to another point. Uh, for this reason, a uh, local a choice, a suitable choice of a local field is rather the derivative of the phase field, because in this way there is no uh, uh, dependence on the choice of reference point. So one could say that the phase field is non local, so one doesn't even expect the horizon effect to, to be uh, valid for that. But for the uh, derivative field, one would definitely expect it to be there. Uh, based on the, the previous uh, physical interpretation. Now, what we see by looking at the numerical data is that by increasing the interaction delta, uh, we, we deviate more and more from the uh, light cone dynamics that uh, we see in the free case. So the left side corresponds to small values of the interaction, and we can see perfectly uh, clearly the, uh, the horizon effect, the fact that correlations are uh, negligible outside of these lines. But when we increase the interaction, we see that uh, uh, eventually, at the largest values, we get uh, a constant even uh, oscillating uh, background of correlations that extends to, to all distances. So this is probably, it looks weird if uh, one takes into account the relativistic invariance on the model. And at first, one would think that this is a numerical artifact. But we have tested this uh, uh, to the highest um, uh, possible uh, cutoff that we could reach. And the, the, ex the, the effect was al always there. And we, we understood that, this, uh, that the, these plots are convergent. And for additional, for comparison, I present here also the case of uh, massive free dynamics. 
uh, you can see that uh, uh, also in this case we see clearly that the horizon effect is present despite the fact that our method uh, is based on the truncation of the Hilbert space, so it's approximate. Nevertheless, it, it uh, rather well uh, captures the horizon effect where we expect it to be. Uh, up to some uh, numerical effect that uh, we uh, have. Uh, so uh, how do you explain physically that uh, I'm violation? going to pass to the, to the, to the explanation right now. Uh, it's going to be a rather long path. Uh, so at first one has to understand, to, to, to go back to the free case and understand why we see the horizon effect in that case. And we, if we try to trace back to the reasons why the horizon effect is present in the free case, we'll understand that it's not sufficient to have relativistic invariance in the dynamics, but we also need to uh, to have exponential clustering of correlations in the initial state. So it's a property that depends on these two factors, uh, relativistic invariance of the dynamics and uh, exponential clustering of initial correlations. Uh, and on the one hand, of course, we are using as initial state for our numerical experiment uh, uh, a short range correlated initial state. Uh, more specifically, the ground state of the Klein-Gordon model for a large value of the mass, as, as large as we can do it numerically. So we make sure that the initial state is short-range correlated. However, uh, the interaction uh, is carried by particles that are no longer local uh, quasi-particles. To be more specific, Mandelstam in 1975 showed that in the quantum model, uh, the excitations, the solitonic excitations are described by uh, fields that, uh, that are non-local uh, with respect to the phase and density uh, fields. And therefore, since the interaction, the, the, the quasi-particles of the interacting dynamics are non-local, we can't expect that the horizon effect should be uh, uh, we, we, we can't guarantee that the horizon effect will be still present in this case. The reason is that uh, these non-local uh, fields uh, could, and as I will see, have actually long-range interactions in the initial state, just because they are non-local themselves. Uh, so let's uh, test this uh, uh, possible explanation by means of an analytical calculation in order to uh, convince ourselves that we are, uh, we, are, we, are, we are giving the right explanation. And this is actually possible, and very fortunately, based on the so-called uh, sine gordon massive steering model duality. Uh, just a few words about dualities. Dualities were int introduced in the uh, 70s by, I think, the, the first pioneers in this field were Mandelstam uh, himself. Uh, who thought that uh, the problem of uh, QCD of being uh, strongly interacting uh, in contrast to QED, which is uh, weakly interacting and therefore can be solved by perturbation theory, can probably be uh, tackled by considering a nonlinear transformation that would map the strongly interacting theory to a weakly interacting theory in terms of completely different fields. So the idea is that two different quantum field theories, in terms of different field representations, uh, can be actually equivalent uh, if we use a nonlinear transformation that identifies, that maps one into the other. And this can be exploited to study strongly interacting dynamics and strongly interacting uh, many-body physics by mapping the problem uh, to uh, the non-interacting or weakly interacting one. Uh, in the context of the sine gordon model, the duality is uh, performed by the so-called boson-fermion uh, identity, uh, by means of which we can write the uh, sine gordon Hamiltonian as a model of interacting fermions, the massive steering model, uh, again relativistic where the interaction parameter G is related to the beta of the sine Gordon model in this uh, very specific uh, uh, way. 
introduced by Coleman when he discovered this, uh, this uh, equivalence. Uh, in particular, uh, as I mentioned at some point earlier, if we tune the interaction to a very specific value, uh, delta is equal to 0 0.5, then the fermion interaction disappears, and the sine gordon model is then equivalent to a model of free, massive uh, Dirac fermions, which means that, uh, which gives us an opportunity, a small window to, to study uh, the dynamics of the sine gordon model by doing this mapping to the uh, uh, free fermion uh, model that can be treated exactly analytically. So to, be, to give some more details, the bosonization identity is uh, given by uh, this formula. Psi is the fermion field and phi is the original uh, boson field. You see it's very complicated and uh, if I had time, I would give more details and I would explain that uh, it's uh, both nonlinear but also non-local because the phi fields are essentially the chiral components of the bosonic field. Uh, but already you can see that uh, it's a non-trivial transformation, field transformation. And the strategy that we, we plan to uh, use is the following. We are interested in the correlations of uh, the uh, phase derivative fields. So what we have to do is to first express them in terms of uh, their, uh, f uh, in terms of the fermionic fields, which is the first step. Second, uh, we are going to do the time evolution of the fermionic fields. We can always uh, solve this exactly uh, and express the time evolved fields in terms of initial fields because the dynamics is linear in this uh, representation. And then go back to the bosonic description in order to calculate the correlations of the fermionic fields in the initial state, which we know in the uh, bosonic uh, framework. Okay, this is just an outline of what we did. And here are the results of this analytical calculation. Uh, so the plot that you see uh, on the top is the space-time uh, plot of the dynamics of uh, DeFi correlations. And we observe that uh, we verify the, the presence of uh, out-of-horizon uh, correlations and their oscillatory uh, form. And also, uh, more importantly, maybe, the fact that these correlations extend all the way to, to infinity. So we have really long-range correlations between the two uh, infinitely far away edges of the system. This is an exact calculation, I should say, that is uh, based on uh, an exact mapping in the finite system. All limits have been taken uh, properly into account, and uh, there is no approximation uh, taking place here. Uh, so, sorry, but still, um this appears uh, an explanation, a mathematical explanation, I may say. Yes. Now, um, I still miss a physical sense for that. So how should I picture that physically? Because, uh, um, I mean, maybe I'm missing something, but somehow the intuition is, uh, I mean, this Lib Robinson bound, uh, you know, makes sense in the sense that, you know, I have something that propagates some signals, some information, some whatever. So it doesn't go instantaneously everywhere. And instead, your horizontal lower red band essentially is telling me that almost instantaneously, poof, it's everywhere. So right. uh, how should I picture that intuitively? So intuitively, the dynamics is perfectly inside the light cone. Uh, Librobis about is still uh, present. But however, Librobison, the Librobison bound applies to the commutator of local fields while correlations uh, are not exactly expressed in terms of uh, commutators. So uh, to be more specific... So uh, that is not what I call a physical explanation. It is still what I call a mathematical explanation. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, and I can follow that, but uh, I would like to have a physical explanation. Yes. The physical explanation is that uh, the initial state, seen from the point of view of the uh, quasi-particles of the interacting Hamiltonian with which we do the dynamics is long-range correlated. So we start with an initial state that is short-range uh, correlated in terms of the local fields, phase, and the density. 
But uh, if I express that very simple initial state in terms of the highly non-trivial uh, uh, fermionic uh, particles, which are non-local in terms of the, the original picture, uh, they, there are long-range correlations between these fermions. Okay, so this, this uh, is already giving me some intuition. Um, however, so, but are you saying that uh, looking at the system in terms of the local observables, this violation of the uh, horizon is not taking place? Or is it taking place? Because if it is taking place, then it means that there is some physical mechanism which uh, implies a propagation of the information faster than, than the speed of sound, say. So the, the, the and I still do not see that, okay? All right. Uh, so based on the, the, if I could show also the exact formulas, perhaps it would be clear. The dynamics does satisfy the relativistic uh, constraints. There is no, nothing uh, propagates faster than light, but the initial state already has uh, some information that is shared through the whole system. By uh, preparing the system to be in that state, uh, and doing the quench, actually by, by performing the quench, which means essentially a change of uh, 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 representation of, the, of the, the initial state, we... we no, sorry, but a quench uh, uh, may mean a change of representation in the initial state mathematically, but a quench is not a mathematical um, operation. I have a system, there are some things here, I prepare them in some state, uh, and then I do some operation to the system. And uh, of course, I can look at this operation in one basis, in another basis, in one representation, in another representation. But the system is there. And uh, the dynamics is induced by the fact that I take a hammer and I hit it. Mm -hmm. So are you saying that the ground state of the system is already correlated at infinite length? I would rather say that by doing the quench, since we do this globally, by performing the quench, uh, we spread the correlations through the system, through the whole system. Because by doing the quench, we, we essentially uh, uh, create uh, quasi-particle excitations that are solitonic excitations. And we can, uh, by doing it globally, we essentially create pairs that can be very far away from each other, but still entangled at the process, or at, the, at the time that we perform Oh, the okay, quench. because, so the, the point is, your, your point is the quench is creating entanglement exactly. immediately, essentially over a time scale, which is that of the quench, and this entanglement is created like in one step everywhere in a sense approximately this is not exactly what happens because there's a little transient but uh, through the quench you are entangling everything with everything else and this is why you indeed violate this uh, uh, i mean in the local basis yes exactly okay. so the violation happens at the time that we do the quench which is never experimentally talking about the experimental system this is happening over a time scale that is uh, much smaller than all other relevant scales. Yes, but that is the non-physical thing because actually you are never going to have a quench which is, which is instantaneous. Exactly. In reality, but that is the source of non-physical non uh, uh, aspect. Yes. Although and, then, uh, and then your point is after I've done the quench, everything is compatible with light con dynamics because actually with the quench I have created everywhere sources of entangled particles which all talk to each other and then of course when it propagates then of course you can have a dynamics like this exactly. so the sort of non-relativistic thing the faster than light thing is the assumption that they have an instantaneous quench and normally in typical Lee Robinson dynamics this is not implying anything but in this particular case this is unraveling this long-range correlation is, is that what you're saying? Exactly. Okay, so that, that's a sort of a physical intuition for me. Of okay. course, this is, again, a philosophical uh, interpretation uh, to, to give uh, uh, to, to more credibility. One would have to consider ramps, as the one that you proposed earlier, 
So, so uh, slower uh, switching of, on, of the interaction and check how these entangled pairs of particles are formed. And that would give a definite answer whether the entanglement of these uh, uh, particles is already there from in the initial state uh, or it is generated by the quench. But our present understanding is that uh, by doing the quench, we do something, if you want, unnatural, if we do it infin infinitely fast. And but then this would be extremely interesting to see what happens if you do it at finite speed, because then if you do it at finite speed, you wouldn't have something like this, and you would have, you know, your quench would create some sort of local uh, entanglement, uh, entangled would, pairs, which then would propagate all together, and it would follow still a Lee Robinson bound. So, so seeing what happens in, in the intermediate regime can be a test of whether this physical interpretation is indeed what is happening there. Exactly. And are you, in, in, are you able to simulate also a, a quench over a finite time? Yes, we can simulate a quench over a finite with your, time uh, with the numerical with your transformation technique. method. Uh, with the transformation, no, because okay. uh, the transformation jumps from essentially right. from That's what three bosons to exactly. three fermions. Right. So. So how would you do the, the for uh, finite? Uh, uh, we can address yeah. that only numerically by uh, switching uh, on the interaction in, a, in within a time interval. So you would use TDMRG or tensor networks or stuff like that. Well, we have this alternative uh, numerical technique that, uh, on the basis of which uh, we produce the results that I showed before. Oh, this uh, truncated conformal space. It's still unclear. We don't have uh, a very good understanding of the the error bounds in that method. Uh, uh, we know that by increasing the cutoff, if we see convergence, we can trust the, the data and uh, believe that they are reliable. But for this case, we really need to have an additional anal analytical uh, um, support uh, of, of this uh, result. But I uh, personally, uh, I find a very interesting question and very interesting uh, direction of research to improve this technique uh, so that it can reach the, the, the efficiency and uh, reliability of DMRG and MPS-based methods, which is not, has not been done so far. This is a method that refers to continuous uh, systems, and so far it hasn't been um, improved in these directions. Uh, okay, so yes, uh, just a few more points. The, uh, the plot at the bottom shows the, the oscillatory uh, background of uh, correlations at infinity, which can also be computed using this exact uh, method. And uh, the small uh, inset uh, at the right corner is just the numerical data that we produced for the largest possible uh, value of the interaction, delta which is still uh, much smaller than the, the value of the interaction corresponding to the free, point, free fermion point, uh, that's the upper plot. But you can see that uh, the oscillations, uh, qualitatively, they have the same behavior. Uh, all the other differences are uh, partly due to the fact that the interaction is different and partly due to the fact that the method is uh, approximate and has, uh, uh, of course, truncation errors. Okay, so uh, just to come back to the explanation, uh, as I said, there is no violation of relativistic invariance. The, the propagation of the local fields uh, is still supported only inside the, the light cones, uh, which is another way to say that the Lee Robinson bound, if you want uh, to see it from the analog of uh, lattice models, uh, is satisfied. Uh, at the, during the dynamics. However, the initial state uh, uh, or the initial state that we see when we perform the quench has already infinite range correlations uh, in terms of a rather artificial uh, field, the fermionic field. So if I do uh, measurements of bosonic uh, uh, operators, bosonic observables, I would never detect this uh, violation of uh, clustering in the initial state, these long-range correlations. But if I measure fermionic fields, which are, in a sense, uh, uh, non-trivial, it's a non-trivial observable because it's uh, long-range, 
then I would, I would be able to see it also in the initial state. Uh, and the role of the dynamics is exactly to, uh, to mix the different fermionic uh, components so that uh, correlations that are initially not uh, uh, detectable can be seen easily in terms of local measurements. Uh, and as I said, the, the one way to, to see this uh, effect is that there are entangled pairs, uh, actually entangled pairs of pairs of soliton anti soliton uh, uh, particles uh, that have infinite range entanglement. Okay, uh, unfortunately I think that I don't have much more time to, to spend on this aspect. Uh, but here are some conclusions. Uh, we use the Hamiltonian truncation methods to uh, simulate numerically uh, the dynamics of uh, correlation functions of the sine golden uh, model. And in principle, we can apply the same technique uh, to, to uh, other continuous uh, quantum field theories in one dimension. Uh, there are also some proposals to use this technique as an alternative to lattice QCD in higher dimensions by high energy theorists. Uh, we've seen some, uh, a number of results, qualitative results about uh, the correlations at equilibrium and also out of equilibrium. And especially we, we uh, on the basis of this uh, numerical experimentation, we stumbled upon this uh, um, unexpected uh, violation of horizon, which we were able to, to uh, explain uh, mathematically using the bosonization technique and the boson fermion correspondence. Uh, okay, and this, with this I would like to end. Let me also thank my collaborators, uh, Ivan Kukulian in Ljubljana and Gabor Takas in Budapest, and our funding uh, sources, the ERC and the ARS is the Slovenian National Research uh, Agency. So thank you for your attention. So, any questions? So, thank you for the talk. I'd like to ask, like the the horizon effect that happens due to uh, due to two relevant factors, right? The relativistic. Which are those basically? So, yeah, just. Uh, so, physically, we need two requirements: that the dynamics is uh, relativistic, okay. uh, or in the lattice case, it satisfies the Lee Robinson bounds. That is, local fields commute. Uh, the time evolved uh, local fields uh, commute if you are outside of their uh, uh, light cones. Uh, and the second requirement is that the initial state has short range correlations. So if you want, uh, maybe I have some explanation. Uh, I removed that, unfortunately. Uh, so the, the explanation of the effect in the free case where exact calculations are possible is based on the combination of these two factors. The fact that uh, uh, the, the propagators are supported only in the past light cone and the initial correlations decay exponentially. Without these, we, we can't uh, hope to have the horizon effect. Fair enough. Thank you. Other questions? So for me, the, so my suspicion is that uh, um, this uh, non-physical uh, instantaneous infinite uh, uh, speed of correlations is a consequence from what you expl explained of the non-physical uh, nature of the quench. And that you picked a nice, uh, intriguing, interesting model in which uh, just this non-physical kick uh, unlocks uh, this non-physical speed. So um, it would be, I, I mean, really to, to, to un answer this question, it's, it's essential to see what happens in a, in a real system with a real finite speed. Mm -hmm. And so is it something that you are planning to do? Yes, we are uh, uh, planning to understand uh, if this can be observed experimentally in uh, this, the, the context of Smith, Professor Schmidt-Meyer's experiment. 
I, I think it's rather a philosophical question whether this uh, uh, process is unfiscal or not. One could see it as uh, a, a, an effect that, is, that takes place during the preparation of the initial state. Uh, well, by initial state, I mean the state that we see when we do the dynamics. Uh, and of course, there is something that uh, might look unfiscal, that is that we change essentially the Hilbert space, we expand the Hilbert space, mathematically uh, thinking of the initial uh, system, which is uh, expressed in terms of bosonic field to those of the compactified boson. This is a topologically non-trivial. Uh, but this is a mathematical question. The physical question, uh, whether you can at all prepare that initial state and how long does it take to actually prepare that initial state which gives you this violation, it's a, a physical question. Yes. Because it's about, I mean, can I have my system and put it in, in some state? Yes. Because if you can put that in that state, then everything else would follow and you would observe that. But the question is, like, can I get infinitely long range entanglement just snapping my fingers? Well, as you said yourself, uh, since it's completely unfiscal to do it instantaneously, uh, the question is if by doing it in a finite uh, time interval, the sequence, we see the same effect or not. And in, in the lab, this is what essentially they are doing. So uh, in the lab, it is possible that this, is, uh, this can be observed uh, because by doing the quents, we have a finite time during which the correlations can spread through the system. And these correlations don't have to spread with the, uh, the speed of, uh, with speed higher than light. It's essentially the speed of sound that, uh, that we are talking about here. And correlations could be, could spread uh, in different ways. Actually, these systems are, after all, uh, the atomic gas is a non relativistic system, so there is no maximum velocity. Uh, apart from the speed of light, which is much, much higher. So I would say that uh, uh, du during the finite time interval uh, during which we do the quench, uh, if that is sufficiently fast, uh, correlations can spread through the whole system. Uh, so, but then the speed of, okay, so but then the speed of uh, 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 propagation of correlation or the Libra Robinson bound, yeah? would be a function, in, the, in this case, would be a function of the speed of the quench. Uh, well, when I'm talking about the Libre Robinson, I'm talking about the, the Libre Robinson bound of the dynamics. Uh, no, sorry, okay, want to forget see... the Libre Robinson, okay. So let's say the speed of propagation of those correlations in the system would be then a function of the speed of the quench. And then if you have an infinite speed quench, on, quench yes. like instantaneous quench, then you have infinite uh, correlation length and infinite speed of propagation. And if instead you do not have infinite speed quench, then correspondingly you would have a finite speed of propagation of those correlations. Is that what, what you are saying? Because that is a physical question, it's not a philosophical one. Well, but without having done this calculation, I can't really... Uh, I, that would be a speculation, but uh, I, th I think that uh, it's either the speed or the magnitude of the, uh, of the, the correlations that we get at infinite range that is uh, modulated by the duration of the quens. Definitely, there is no violation of uh, relativity during any of these uh, steps. Uh, Nothing propagates at infinite uh, speed. Uh, after all, there is the, the maximum speed of, of propagation, which is the speed of light. Uh, but to, to say if it is the speed of the propagation of uh, information or the, the amplitude of the correlations or whatever, how this, how this picture gets modified if I do the quench in a finite time, it's not, it's not uh, easy to, to see uh, for, for me. So do you think that there could be a finite speed quench which could yield, nevertheless, infinite correlation immediately? Uh, 
I think it's possible, yes. Because well, it after violates causality, so if you can get that, uh, I guess you get some very big price. No, 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 you don't violate causality. But yes, as, because as I said, if, you are, if we are talking about this specific uh, experimental system, there is no uh, maximum group velocity because the dispersion is, uh, after all, parabolic at large energies. Now, if you are talking about uh, the speed of light, which is the, 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 what you get at even higher energies, obviously this is the, the maximum speed of propagation of information that you can get. This, is, this effect is nothing, at, nothing different from uh, a, a macroscopic or statistical version of the EPR paradox. Correlations are uh, there when we prepare the initial state. However, no, no, but that's prepare. exactly the point. No, no, no. Uh, this, oh, I mean, the EPR paradox is something in which I have two particles, one here and one there, and they are not created by God like this, but they, if they are the effect of a physical, not mathematical process, then it means that those particles they have interacted at some point, and then they have moved. And then the time it takes for them to get to that distance is dependent on the physical process, which was before, the dynamics, I mean, where they have interacted and how fast have they moved and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so this is precisely exactly because of this reason, the EPR paradox requires that those particles have interacted in the past and they were local in some place and they have moved around. So they, in the EPR paradox, they never show up, uh, you know, magically in an entangled state. Exactly, so this is what is happening here. So by preparing the state, by creating, if you want, the, the solitons, there is a, a minimum of time that is required for uh, the, the construction of these uh, uh, long range, if you want, of these non-local fields and the long range correlations uh, that are... Right, sorry. I agree. And so and for I me the question is this minimum time. So if there is a minimum time, then it means that it is not instantaneous, like you said before, because instantaneous means no minimum time. So I agree with your current statement, and uh, I do not see the previous one. The previous statement is that I can instantaneously change. And is, sorry, and this is. Yes, yes. So, okay, I will continue giving the answer at least. <laughs> so, uh, there is infinite time in preparing the initial state, and uh, there is possibly a, a minimum time that is required in order to uh, change. The, the, to switch on the interaction in order to see this effect. So during that time, uh, by constructing the fermionic, uh, the, the non-local uh, quasi-particles, we essentially uh, have also the time to, to get them entangled with each other over infinite uh, distance. So this, this is something that has to do with uh, uh, the preparation of the initial state and not uh, with uh, the dynamics after that. Any other questions? But, I mean, probably is what we were discussing, but I missed a bit. But the, the fact that you move from uh, the bosonic representation to the fermionic one uh, is, a, is, a, is a formal treatment that you do. You are not doing any field. Anything, anything physical, I mean. But you're saying that you are preparing that state and that state is already correlated in, in a long range way. And then you are saying that when you do the quench, then only the cone is related to the quench, but all the other correlation will all, were already there. Is that? That's true. It's, it's only the fact that when, I, when I'm talking about the state, I refer to a specific Hilbert space uh, the state lives in a Hilbert space, and uh, the Hilbert space tells me which are the observables that I can use in order to uh, probe the correlations. So by doing the quench, I essentially expand the Hilbert space to include uh, fermionic uh, 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 fields, which are highly non-local with respect to the bosonic. So by doing that, I induce extra correlations, if you want, in the initial state. Of course, this is something that uh, Which you can see. Which are that spread in the light cone? It, it, I would say that it's not the physical mechanism that leads to the spreading of the uh, correlations uh, through the whole system, but it's rather 
it's a, it's a philosophical interpretation if you want that uh, you, you can say that the initial state already has these uh, correlations which are uh, however not seen uh, in the uh, restricted set of observables of the bosonic theory uh, but they are definitely possible to observe in, if we uh, expand in the fermionic uh, the, the, the tensor, tensor product of bosonic times fermionic Hilbert space or that they are created by this artificial thing of uh, uh, switching on the interaction. There are all sorts of problems in quantum field theory when we change bases, like Hagg's theorem, which tells us that the one Hilbert space is not uh, always possible to uh, be considered as a, a, a unitary transformation of the Hilbert space of the um, uh, interacting theory.